Foundation here at the Curry School. Okay. I think we'll go ahead and get started. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, welcome to the Curry School of Education, and thank you for attending the Curry Research Lectureship Series. I'm Kylie LeBlanc, an education policy doctoral student at the Curry School of Education. Uh, this series is sponsored primarily by the Virginia Education Sciences Training, or VEST, pre-doctoral program, which is supported by the U.S. Department of Education Institute of Education Sciences. The VEST program applies rigorous research methods and analytical techniques in the social science field to study school and classroom effects. Today, we are delighted to welcome Dr. Vivian Wong. Vivian is a research methodologist in the field of education. Currently, Dr. Wong is an assistant professor in research statistics and evaluation here at the Curry School. Um, her research focuses on evaluating interventions in early childhood and um, K-12 systems. And as a methodologist, her expertise is in improving the design, implementation, and analysis of experimental regression discontinuity, interpretive time series, and matching designs in field settings. As a student of Vivian, I can tell you that she is always thoughtful and exacting in her work and that she holds the highest standard for her students as she does for herself. Um, but thankfully, she's also a patient teacher. <laughs> uh, Dr. Wong will be taking approximately one hour and we'll leave 15 to 30 minutes for discussions or questions. Um, please note that any additional questions after that point um, can be addressed via email because she has other meetings beginning at that time. Attending the Research Lectureship Series, and please join me in welcoming Vivian Wong. Thank you very much, Kylie, for that very um, generous introduction. Um, so is this weird? Is the microphone weird? OK. Um, so, um, so I am really excited to be here to present these results for two reasons. Um, the first is because this has really been a project that has taken a long time, and it's been a true collaborative effort between me and a couple of uh, students in research statistics and evaluation. Basically, this project came about one day because Cody and I were taking a very long walk along Lake Michigan one day, and we, we talked about this idea and said, wow, wouldn't it be great? Wouldn't it be neat if somebody did this idea? And then I came back, and I talked to David, and then later I talked to Anandita, and they have really done much of the heavy lifting um, on this project. So please, I want to give David and Anandita credit for their tremendous contributions on this project. The other reason why I'm really excited to talk about uh, uh, the study today is that this is the first time that we are presenting our sort of main outcome results. So um, I look forward to hearing your feedback, and please do feel free to interrupt if you have any questions along the way. So I wanted to start this talk by contextualizing a little bit about uh, what we're going to be thinking about today. This was a photo that was taken in 1965. Um, it's a picture of Lyndon Johnson signing basically the most important piece of legislation in education history. Um, does anybody know, any history buffs here, know what he is signing? Go ahead. Yeah. Ding, ding, ding. That's exactly, well, you can read that part. All right. Good job. I'll give you credit for that anyways. Um, so, Lyndon Johnson signed the ESEA on April 11th, 1965, and there were many components of the ESEA. It became rewritten over the years, um, but the main thing that it did was that it, for the first time, basically introduced federal authority into uh, improving equity between schools, right? So, as one component of the ESEA was to introduce Title I funds. And in fact, Lyndon Johnson really felt like that this piece of legislation was really the centerpiece of the war on poverty. When he signed this piece of legislation, he said, as the son of a tenant farmer, I know that education is only valid in its passport from poverty, the only valid passport. 
as a former teacher, and I hope a future one, I have great expectations of what this law will mean for all our young people. As President of the United States, I believe deeply no law I have signed or will ever sign will mean more to the future of America. Okay. Now, if Lyndon Johnson had seen this figure that was made by Sean Reardon in 2011, he would have seen this figure as sort of a crystal ball into the future of what, will, what is to come, basically. Um, and what this figure shows is basically the achievement gaps between the poorest and the wealthiest families in the United States between 1940 and 2000, okay? Um, and what you can basically see in sort of the fitted regression line here is that around 1960 or so, uh, the achievement gap was basically pretty flat, even declining. And then around the 1980s, it sort of took a sharp sort of uh, turn and the achievement gap started to increase till about the year 2000 there. What was happening legislatively, right, is that this box, this shaded box here, indicates when uh, Lyndon Johnson basically signed ESEA, and over the next 15 years, it was rewritten a number of times, okay? But its main emphasis was on sort of the federal government's role in distributing uh, resources and support for improving sort of equality between uh, different schools. That happened until about the 1980s when the Reagan administration came in, right? And the Reagan administration really took a different turn with the ESEA legislation. Instead of having the federal government be an authority for basically redistributing um, wealth to sort of improve inequality between schools, it sort of turned the focus more towards state and local control. Okay, so that uh, uh, state and local districts would have more say over how it would improve sort of education quality in the United States. 1994, basically, under the first George Bush, ESA was basically written again to the Imo Improving America School Act. And now, for the first time, under the Improving America School Act, uh, standards were introduced that were tied to basically uh, English learning proficiency and math proficiency, okay? Schools, Title I schools were still not held accountable for their performance, right? But standards were introduced um, at 1994. Finally, 2002, No Child Left Behind is introduced, right? And No Child Left Behind is basically the biggest reform of ESEA since it was introduced in 1965, okay? And as what you guys all know in this room, right, when No Child Left Behind was passed in 2002, the legislation promised two things, right? First, it promised increased transparency of different state accountability laws, right? States and districts across the country before then in the 90s were experimenting with different accountability laws. Now what NCLB did was that it assured that states and districts had to sort of follow some regulations about what they could be held accountable for. And it also promised that all students would be proficient by 2014. And this was all students, right? Not just certain types of students or high income or low income students, but all students. In exchange for these two pretty lofty promises, right? Uh, what NCLB sort of mandated in order for these goals to be reached were basically three things, right? First, local and states had to lose, cede some of their federal, their authority over to the Department of Education, okay? So there was basically increased oversight from the federal Department of Education over schools. It also required annual testing of students, okay? But it did not mandate what tests states would administer. And it also mandated that now there would be consequences attached to school performance, right? So schools would either have to develop. Schools that didn't meet proficiency requirements would have to formulate plans for improving their schools or they had, would have to be restructured and reconstituted. And it was important that this wasn't just a legislative change, okay? It required tremendous resources, right? NCLB was expensive. So between 2000 and 2010, the budget for the Federal Department of Education almost doubled. It increased from 33 to 63 billion. 
And just to administer the standardized testing alone was about $1.6 billion per year. So it was an expensive initiative as well. Okay, so now we're back to sort of where we, now we're back to sort of modern times, right? Um, more than 10 years later, maybe about 15 years later, uh, we sort of have a sense of what our sort of public attitudes were towards how our No Child Left Behind experiment went, right? On the right, right, folks uh, on the right, right, were really critical of No Child Left Behind. And in fact, uh, Senator Lamar Alexander from Tennessee, who eventually rewrote uh, the legislation for replacing No Child Left Behind, sort of commonly criticized NCLB as basically establishing the Department of Education as a national school board for all 100,000 public schools. This was a common sort of criticism that NCLB was a one-size-fits-all kind of uh, solution for a problem. NCLB was also the kind of legislation that inspired uh, criticism on groups that traditionally represent the left, too, right? So teachers and teacher unions uh, also opposed NCLB, right? And many teachers complained that the legislation or that the mandates were too restrictive, it focused on testing, right? And in addition, stakeholders, local <laughs> stakeholders, parents, uh, school administrators also said that they hated No Child Left Behind because of its emphasis on standardized testing and its restrictive nature. Okay. And even people who traditionally kind of clamor for big changes in policy, researchers, right? Also, we also had trouble with No Child Left Behind too. And one of the main reasons was because NCLB was introduced to states all at the same time, right? So there was no real obvious comparison group, right? So it was hard to do research. Another issue was that even though NCLB affected all states at the same time, right, there were still reports or there's still potential criticism that the way that it was actually getting implemented on the ground level was varying across states, right? So for example, critics raised these concerns that states were choosing different tests, right? And that state, some states could choose easier tests to hold their schools accountable and other states could choose a harder test, right? States also had leeway in terms of the proficiency thresholds that they would set, right? So the states could start by setting really low proficiency thresholds for holding their schools accountable and only increase them in sort of the latter period, right? So we had this sense that there was variation in how states were responding, okay? But we didn't have an actual sense for how much variation there was across states and how they implemented NCLB, right? And the main reason for this was that most of the main implementation studies of NCLB during this period tended to focus on either a subsample of states, a subsample of districts, a subsample of years, right, either during the beginning part or the middle part, or they focused on a subset of rules, right, so how difficult were tests across states. And really for us to be able to kind of be able to offer a descriptive picture of how states responded to NCLB, what would have been ideal here would have been some kind of quantitative summary, right, that describes all of the implementation decisions that states had made across the full pre-waiver period of NCLB. So the, free, the, the full uh, pre-waiver period that I'm gonna define here is basically between 2003 when NCLB was actually implemented and 2011 before waivers were introduced. Um, right now, our current best evidence of evaluations of NCLB suggests that NCLB had positive impacts for math, but not for reading, okay? And basically, the identification strategy that Dee and Jacobs used here was that they took states that had pre-NCLB accountability policies as the comparison group and compared their outcomes basically to states that were, had to newly implement new accountability policies once NCLB was enacted. And the idea here is that states with pre-NCLB accountability policies before 2002 didn't have to make as much of a switch or didn't have to make as much of a change. So they're sort of, they would sort of continue as business as usual basically, okay? 
But even this sort of counterfactual was not ideal in a number of different ways, right? So states, one way that this uh, counterfactual, this comparison might not be ideal is that even states with pre-NCLB accountability policies may have been affected by NCLB itself, okay? That another uh, issue with this comparison was that this was somewhat of a crude comparison between two states, right? That even sort of within states with pre and uh, not pre uh, NCLB accountability policies, that states did respond to federal requirements um, in different ways, okay? And that changed over time, okay? And another sort of limitation of, of their original results was that it didn't include all states in the District of Columbia in their analysis. So the generalization of their results was a little, is limited here, okay? Um, and their outcome analysis stopped basically at 2007. So they were able to evaluate effects for the beginning part of NCLB, but not towards the latter period. So what I wanna talk about today is basically our approach for how we're going to evaluate No Child Left Behind. And there's basically two main contributions I think of in terms of the study. The first sort of contribution, which took us a long time to figure out, was developing and introducing this new implementation measure that described each state's accountability plan during the full pre-waiver period from 2003 to 2011. This measure is a quantitative summary of all rules implemented by states uh, including its proficiency trajectories, the test difficulties, and the adoption of exemption rules, okay? And what's really nice about this measure, which I'll explain more later, is that it is reflective of the stringency of the state policies themselves, but does not confound or sort of take account, basically, population characteristics of the performance of schools and students living within that state. So that's gonna be really useful for evaluation purposes. Then using this measure, we're going to evaluate basically how states responded to the federal mandate uh, for school accountability requirements and whether implementation stringency then affected schools' responses and then students' responses um, to these new requirements, okay? Any questions here? Okay, uh, so what I wanna start, uh, I always tell my students in our evaluation classes that is that we need to start with a conceptual theory, so I'm gonna try to do a good job and model that here. But basically, this is in broad strokes, sort of the conceptual theory of what a proponent of NCLB would suggest is how this is going to work, right? How this accountability program is going to work, right? First, what we have is that we have a federal mandate, that's our lever that students are 100% proficient by 2014, okay? Once that federal mandate is set, is set, then states are responsible for enacting a number of policies to help their schools basically meet that mandate, right? So now states implement accountability requirements, okay? Once the states basically set their, uh, their accountability requirements in terms of proficiency thresholds, in terms of tests that their students and schools will have to take, right? Now schools tr uh, attempt to basically respond to states' accountability pressures, okay? And schools can respond in a multiple different ways, right? They can either align, they can align their resources in order to improve instructional practices, okay? But they can also take other measures in order to be able to meet accountability requirements, but not necessarily improve sort of quality teaching itself, right? The final step is that if schools are sort of taking um, measures to improve sort of instructional practice within schools, right, is that what we should see is that there should be some kind of improvement on students' achievements on some other, on another sort of outcome measure that is not sort of directly uh, used to hold the schools accountable themselves, right? Let me just offer a preview of results of where we're gonna go from here, okay? And basically what we find is this, right? That states did implement, uh, states implementation of the NCLB, it did introduce variation in how accountability policy was uh, introduced in a number of states. That did happen, okay? But state accountability policies also became more stringent over time, okay? And they also did become more uniform. So uh, accountability standards also became less discrepant, 
under the pre-waiver period. Okay. We also see evidence that schools were also mostly keeping up with these new sort of intensified pressures uh, to keep up with accountability requirements. Okay. S schools are mostly being responsive to uh, these new accountability standards. However, schools' responsiveness to accountability standards aren't necessarily translating over into actual uh, a student achievement or improvement. Um, we see that there's either sort of not much evidence that students are improving under NCLB for m m the most and the least stringent states, right, or that the achievement gains that we do see are, are small, are very small. Okay, so let me introduce our implementation measure and tell you sort of the logic or describe to you basically how we created this measure, okay? The main sort of, the, the, the idea of our implementation measure is that we sort of, um, it sort of focused on basically on this idea, right? That under No Child Left Behind, schools were held accountable based on whether subgroups in schools met state's annual adequate yearly progress requirements. And there was a number of different requirements that each school had to meet. I think it was about, um, there were 36 different rules, I believe, okay? Um, and so these rules included things like the minimum sort of percent proficiency that subgroups had to obtain, participation in graduation rates, whether or not they sort of would adopt, they made, uh, AYP requirements based on safe harbor and confidence intervals and confidence intervals around safe harbor targets, okay? And basically, once you take all of these rules into account, a state would determine whether A, the school met or exceeded requirements for AYP, or they would fail to make these requirements. So let me just sort of be concrete here and illustrate how this might actually play out, okay? These are basically a summary of different AYP accountability rules for four different states, for Pennsylvania, Alaska, Tennessee, and Texas, okay? For some of these rules, they were pretty much standard across all of the states. So for example, for all four of these states, the, particip the test participation requirement was 95%, okay? But there was also sort of substantial variation on some of these other rules. Right, so here states vary basically in terms of what their minimum subgroup sizes were, okay? They also varied in terms of what the minimum proficiency thresholds were for both English and our ELA and for math here, okay? And whether or not they adopted what I call confidence or exemption rules. Basically exemption rules are rules that allow states to adjust their effective proficiency cutoffs and mostly sort of lower these proficiency cutoffs to make it easier for schools uh, to make um, AYP, okay? And based on these rules, then um, a certain percentage of schools for each different year for each state would fail or make AYP, okay? Now, how I'm gonna define sort of accountability stringency is just based on how hard it is for schools to make these AYP rules, okay? So more stringent accountability rules means that it's harder for schools, it's a higher bar for schools to reach in order to make AYP for the year. Less stringent rules mean that it's easier for schools to make AYP, okay? Now, one inferior, one bad option, right, for measuring stringency um, is just to basically use the percentage of schools that fail, right, um, within each year and each state, okay? This is not something that anybody here would do, okay? But people out there in the real world, if you read a newspaper article, these are the types of comparisons that they might make, okay? The problem with this, right, is most people here know, is that this is confounding sort of two things, right? Is that it's confounding the idea of how hard each state's accountability rules are and the actual performance, right, of schools and students within each state, right? So the way that I sort of think about this is that if you look at sort of the uh, percent sort of failure rate for schools within each state, that's kind of like looking at whether or not a high jumper makes it across sort of the high bar here, right, as a measure of sort of performance here, right? 
And the problem with sort of looking at the performance of the high jumper, right, is that it mixes up two things, right? It mixes up how high that bar is, right? And the actual ability of the high jumper, right? So what we want to do here is we want to be able to separate out how high that bar is from the actual performance of the athlete or the high jumper here, okay? So an ideal measure of state implementation stringency separates the state policies from the characteristics of schools and students who are within the state. Okay, so the basic idea that we're gonna do here, right, is that instead of just looking at actual failure, AYP failure rates among schools, is that we're gonna start with some kind of fixed data set. Right, so let's say that our fixed data set is basically the population of schools that are in Pennsylvania, okay? And we're gonna take all of the input characteristics from all of the schools within Pennsylvania, their subgroup sizes, their performances, their participation rates, right? And we're gonna compare those characteristics to the AYP rules for each of the other different states, okay? So in this table here, basically that's what I've done. Um, so in Pennsylvania, right, uh, the, when I sort of apply all the rules for Pennsylvania, um, I get a simulated failure rate there of 27%. That's actually pretty close to what the actual failure rate is, 28%. So that is good. That suggests that uh, we've correctly sort of accounted for all of those rules, okay? But now these other numbers on the bottom row ask how would the same group, how would the same sort of set of Pennsylvania schools perform under Alaska's rules? In this case, only 54% 50, of these schools would have failed uh, AYP requirements in Alaska. And in Tennessee's case, 70% of the schools would have failed. And in Texas, 33% of the schools would have failed. So what this suggests is basically that Tennessee's rules, Tennessee's policies are much more stringent than Pennsylvania's, right? That their policies themselves are more stringent and not just that Tennessee schools themselves are higher performing schools, okay? So, um, so basically now what we do here, this, is just, this just gives you a, a snapshot, right, of some of the rules that uh, have gone into sort of our calculator, okay? But now basically imagine expanding this out to all of the rules for all of the states and for the whole pre-waiver period from 2003 to 2011. Chelsea. Not yet, but I'm going to get to that in just one minute. So just hang on for a minute. But that's a really good question because that's a main issue. Go ahead, Jason. Oh, Luke, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so does this, is there an IOS cut to Tennessee and poverty? I'm assuming that would be that. If you were to take Tennessee schools mm -hmm. and apply them, would you still have the same relative ranking that Tennessee so ideally you should have the same relative rankings though the stringency scores themselves may not be the same right um, so that's one of the issues right is whether this is sensitive to the actual fixed sample that you start with okay and what we do is we've tested among different fixed samples they're all pretty it gives us basically stringency scores that are highly correlated it really makes a difference basically if you choose a fixed sample that is missing like some kind of subgroup or some kind of doesn't reflect some kind of variation that you need begin with. Jim. So my question is, how are you thinking about what the definition of the NCLB truth is? So that's right, right? So um, we could talk more about this later, right? But here now what we're thinking about is the impact not just of NCLBs, whether NCLB was, was enacted or not, right? It's the impact of implementation stringency of NCLB, right? So the, the comparisons are basically uh, more and less stringently, you know, uh, accountability rules. Yeah, and I meant to talk about it more later, but, but in point of fact, mm -hmm. I think NCLB was designed with great latitude. Right. 
And so you're taking what would be, might be the most extreme version, an extrinsic version, and calling that the NCLB treatment or the NCLB stringency treatment. Or that's right. That's exactly that. right. NCLB. That's right. But that may or may not be, in some sense, an evaluation of NCLB. Right, so of, of accountability itself, right. So this is about sort of evaluations of uh, how intense or, or sort of how high standards were, uh, accountability standards were. Along these dimensions. Along these specific dimensions, that's right. That's exactly right. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so in terms of basically how we implemented it, it was in three not so easy steps. Um, basically, the first step was using all of our publicly, using all the publicly available information that was available online. We coded all AYP policies for every state and year between 2003 and 2011. And by we, I mean David here. So let me give David uh, credit for this. Um, and then using this database of all AYP policies, we constructed what we call an AYP calculator that determines based on sort of input characteristics from the school, whether that school would fail AYP for a particular state and for a year, okay? And then once we had the calculator, we basically fed our fixed baskets of students or schools into the calculator in order to be able to construct our measures of AYP stringency for each state and year. Okay. So the way that you can really think about our stringency measure is, for a fixed sample of schools, what fraction of those schools would meet AYP standards across different states and years? All right, so Chelsea raised an excellent question, right, is that until now I haven't talked at all really about the fact that states also had leeway in terms of the test that they chose. And, you know, observers of NCLB noted that that these tests basically differed across states, that some were easier and some were harder, okay? Um, and so to be able to sort of fully uh, evaluate or assess sort of implementation, we had to take account of test difficulty. So um, one of the things that we sort of, that we take advantage of here is the fact that NCES uh, maps proficiency cutoffs onto NAEP scale scores just for fourth and for eighth graders, okay? So for each of the different state assessment scores, or state assessments, um, it basically finds what it calls the equivalent NAEP scale score for what would be the proficiency threshold for that state and for that year. So the way that we sort of use this information is now we define our fixed sample as, um, as students in the NAEP sample and compare their NAEP scale scores to NAEP equivalent state cutoff scores. And so what that basically does is that states with, e with uh, easier tests are gonna have lower NAEP equivalent cutoff scores and states with harder tests are gonna have higher NAEP equivalent cutoff scores. And that basically incorporates now test difficulty within our stringency measure. Um, so just to summarize, basically, these are all of the AYP rules that our, our calculator accounts for. What it does not account for is it does not include, basically, rules about growth models, okay? Um, and it does not account for alternative modified tests for students with disabilities and proficiency indices, okay? Growth models become sort of a much more important rule, basically, towards the latter part of NCLB. Um, particularly after the pre-waiver period, okay? So um, in sort of in the, in the research that we've done, mostly before 2011, growth models didn't have uh, a lot of sort of consequential accountability, uh, uh, um, um, or it didn't have a lot of consequences in terms of holding schools accountable. Um, but this would be an issue if we continued to extend this past the pre-waiver period. So one main question about our stringency measure is whether it actually accurately reflects um, each state's AYP uh, policies, right? If it does not, then that's gonna suggest there's gonna be a lot of measurement error in our stringency uh, score here. And basically, to sort of evaluate this, we produce basically a qualitative rating of our subjective assessment of how well um, we were able to copy rules, okay? And then we also did an empirical validation. So basically, for half the states plus the District of Columbia, we felt like we did a pretty good job in being able to replicate their AYP rules, okay? 
About 25 of the states, we had to amend or approximate their rules in some kind of way. For Ohio, because they, their AYP rules included consequential growth models, we did not feel comfortable with how our stringency measure reflected their performance, so we omit Ohio from our analyses. Here, what we also did was we empirically validated the performance of the stringency measure, and in order to do this, we basically took sort of the information from that state the, on the population of schools, okay? We ran that population of schools through our calculator in order to get basically what we would predict as the AYP failure rates, and then compare that to the reported AYP failure rates from that state, okay? If our calculator performed perfectly, then what you should see is that all of these dots would line up exactly on that 45 degree line, okay? And we did pretty well here. This is an example of Ohio, right? Ohio kind of falls away from that line a little bit. That is because of the growth models. Some of these other sort of differences it has to do actually with uh, data that the states don't report, so we weren't able to fully implement their AYP rules. Um, and I want to give David and Anadita credit for this work here. The empirical validation work was definitely um, time consuming and also <laughs> um, uh, all of, based on all of their work. Okay, so again, let me um, uh, summarize advantages of the measure. So what we've done is that we've synthesized state decisions about accountability policies into a single quantitative measure of stringency. We provide an annual measure for each state's accountability intensity, and that measure is in independent of population characteristics of the state. Limitations of the measure is that it may not account for all possible AYP rules, okay? So we conducted validation checks. And it might be sensitive to sample characteristics, right? So, uh, so this is the question that Luke asked. So what we've done is we've checked our results with alternative uh, sample, fixed samples. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide, but we can come back to that. Um, so let me just get into some of the results um, now that I've introduced our stringency measure, okay? So the first thing that we did was we looked at basically how states responded to the federal NCLB mandate, okay? How much variation was there in, in stringency across states, okay? And basically these two plots uh, sort of uh, demonstrate sort of the trajectory of the, the stringency, uh, of, of the average sort of uh, stringency scores across time. On the left panel here, basically plots uh, stringent simulated failure rates or our stringency scores for the 90th, 10th percentile, 75th, 25th percentile, and then for the median. What you could observe here is that, as you would expect, right, stringency is increasing over time from the beginning to the end of the pre-waiver period, okay? With this plot on the, the right-hand side shows is basically the 90-10 ratio. Um, so the difference, basically, the ratio between sort of the most and the least stringent states from the beginning of the period to the end of the period. That ratio decreases from about 3.6 to about 2.25 here, okay? So what that suggests is that even though there is substantial variation in states' uh, stringency rates uh, across time, they are becoming less discrepant. So standards are becoming more uniform across time. However, as I mentioned, there was, sort of, there was variation in, uh, in state stringency um, uh, uh, over time. Um, what this plot does, which is hard to read, but it's a spaghetti plot of basically the differences in, in, in trajectories of how states implemented NCLB. And what I've just done is that I've centered basically all of the stringency scores at 2003, okay? And the main thing that I want you to get a sense of is that the majority of states did increase their stringency under NCLB. About 14 states decreased or kept their stringency to be the same. Okay, so um, these states down here tended to have, um, they had sort of, they started with medium high sort of accountability rules, right? Um, and in some cases they, towards the end of NCLB, uh, where they adopted sort of uh, generous exemption rules that lowered basically their proficiency cutoffs. Uh, Nebraska, for example, actually decreased its AMO or its uh, proficiency thresholds. Um, and what I would also say here is that Connecticut is just the kind of modal 
uh, sort of stay in terms of increasing its uh, implementation stringency. So basically, in the first part of the NCLV, um, the trajectory is pretty flat, which is basically reflective of the fact that in the early years, uh, lots of states were introducing exemption rules that basically watered down their accountability policies. And then in the latter period, they started ratcheting up their uh, stringency based on increasing proficiency thresholds. Yes? So it goes from zero to 100. Okay, um, so that should be easy to interpret. <laughs> Sorry, so stringency in 2003, what was the sort of median or median stringency level in 2003? The median was about, uh, about 38. Yeah. And then by the end, it sort of. They had plenty of room to move up. Yeah, they had plenty of room. It increased about 33% across that time period. But not a lot of room to move down. Really. Not too much. Basically, you can move down by sort of adjusting your, your thresholds lower or by adopting exemption rules. Any other questions? Okay, so once we sort of noted the fact that there was heterogeneity basically in how states implemented their accountability rules, we wanted to basically look for state factors that would explain the, uh, the variation in stringency. Okay, so we basically ran regressions of stringency, state stringency as the outcome is a function of a number of different types of state characteristics, right? So one of those characteristics was whether or not states had a pre-NCLB accountability policy, okay? Another was basically baseline achievement on NAEP, right? So did states with higher or lower achieving students adopt more stringent accountability policies? As well as a number of other kinds of demographic characteristics about the states. And one of the things that surprised us actually was that there wasn't much uh, in terms of a significant relationship between states' accountability stringency and their baseline accountability policies or student achievement. And their implementation trajectories didn't really change based on these baseline characteristics either, okay? One of the things that was related to stringency scores was that more educated uh, states with more educated populations larger percentages of whites and Hispanic st students tended to implement more stringent versions of NCLB accountability standards. So let me just show you sort of a plot of regression results, right, where we plot basically um, simulated failure rates, regression-adjusted simulated failure rates by states with pre-NCLB accountability policies and no pre-NCLB accountability policies. Basically, you could see that states without pre-NCLB accountability policies had, on average, higher, more stringent uh, accountability rules, but this wasn't statistically significant, okay? And the way that, NC how NCLB rolled out was basically the same across these two different sets of states. One thing that is interesting to note from this plot is that um, you can sort of see the trajectory of how NCLB was implemented across these two sets of states, okay? What we also overlaid here was information taken from Gallup polls, right, about Americans' attitudes towards the education sector during the same time period, right? You can see that's mostly pretty flat here. This is the percent with negative views towards the education sector during the same time period. It's pretty flat. And basically, it starts to ratchet up just as accountability stringency is also ratcheting up in a lot of states too, right? Um, now, that relationship might be spurious, but it's interesting to note that public opinion towards sort of education and the education sector basically sort of took a turn for the more negative just as basically these policies started to have more bite to them. Okay, so policy conclusions. So. Uh, Basically, at least from the results of our descriptive analyses, right, one conclusion is that the one-size-fits-all narrative is wrong about NCLB, that there was substantial variation in how states implemented accountability policies, and that they were able to sort of manipulate how stringent or not stringent their rules were based on their adoption or their implementation of these policies. Generally, states with more educated and white and Hispanic populations tended to adopt more stringent accountability policies.
but there wasn't much variation in stringency based on pre-NCLB accountability policies or by baseline achievement, okay? Um, still, NCLB, as, a, as sort of a federal mandate, right, did succeed in encouraging states to ratchet up accountability requirements, okay? So the next question then, basically, in our conceptual model is that it appears that states did respond to the federal mandate, okay? Now the question is, did schools also respond? Go ahead. Well, yeah. Do you feel like now you have uh, evidence to suggest that the Dean and Jacob identification strategy is not valid? So can I come back to this at the end? Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. We're basically looking at two different things, right? And I don't, I, let me come back to that. Yeah, go ahead. Separate. Controlling for separate, yeah. Because um, I guess I'm still, I'm, the one thing that's in this model is about fully content population. So yeah. I'm going to see, you know, things like assault groups that have to be counted in your accountability policy. So I'm, I'm yeah. just wondering if there's factors in For controlling for whites and Hispanics so at the same time? or? For me, Hispanics, specifically. So okay. In the sense that if you have a really Oh, I see. So then, is it saying that it's more stringent because they've had to relax that because they breached the policy? I mean, I'm not as yeah. well versed in this area. Yeah, so let me think about that. I mean, we're using sort of the lagged versions of these. Okay. So, um, and let me think more about that. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. So that um, the figure with the stringent of the public opinion mm -hmm. and then the stringency of the criteria. I just wanted to check, is the public opinion about the education sector, do you mean like opinions towards teachers or? This is broadly speaking. So this was basically from Gallup poll data where they ask you, where they asked per respondents like what is your view, what's like what's your view towards the education sector as a whole. So in this case, this wasn't broke, whoops. Sorry, broken out by teachers or schools or, or whatever. This is just broadly the education sector. Okay, so let's look at now um, this idea of sort of trying to understand how schools responded to states' implementation stringency. So now we're sort of moving from the descriptive side to thinking about some of the impact evaluation, okay? Now, let me just remind folks that our experimental ideal here would be that um, that we randomly assign basically stringency scores or stringency levels to each of the different states for each of the different years. If we were able to do that, right, uh, we could just run a pretty straightforward regression of uh, school outcomes or student outcomes on our stringent, on a stringency measure here, okay? And our estimate of beta one here could be interpreted as being causal. So we get sort of partly there through our simulated stringency score because our stringency score is not confounded with population characteristics of the state, okay? But it could be that there could be factors, state characteristics that uh, are, you know, basically policymakers could have information about their states and they could in turn then adopt, you know, more or less stringent accountability rules based on their own sort of knowledge about the states or about their populations, okay? So what we're gonna do here is that, in addition, we're gonna adopt basically a difference in difference approach with the simulated stringent, with our simulated stringency rates. So we're gonna include state fixed effects to control for basically uh, sort of time invariant state factors or attitudes, uh, time fixed effects to control for um, sort of macro things that are happening uh, in general across the country, we're, we're gonna include a vector of time varying covariates, okay? And then there's the error term here. And now basically, we're gonna interpret our coefficient as being sort of the impact of uh, differences in stringency score on our outcomes. So in order to sort of think about how we're gonna evaluate school responses, right, it's helpful to sort of think about sort of how schools might be responding to accountability pressures to, as our starting point, right? 
Their first story is this, right? Their, their first story is like a proponent of NCLB would say that schools take account, take actions to basically align their instructional practice with student outcomes so that they make AYP. So what that means is that tougher standards will lead to performance gains and you won't actually have to fail that many schools, right? So that basically schools are sort of keeping up with the ratcheting up of uh, accountability rules. The second story says that uh, schools are already doing everything that they can, okay, and that higher accountability standards will just result in more failing schools, okay? So you ratchet up accountability stringency by one unit and basically you see a corresponding number of schools fail there, okay? So the way that we could sort of frame this, right, in, in the model is that we could sort of look at the relationship between simulated fail rates and actual fail rates, right? And if basically in a static model where schools are unable to really respond to increasing accountability pressures, what you would see is a one-to-one -one relationship, right? This blue line here. You increase uh, stringency by one unit, failure rates go up by one unit, right? In a scenario where schools are actually able to sort of keep up with some of these increasing demands, the story would go like this. You increase stringency by one unit, right? And maybe more schools are failing, but they're not failing at the same level that you would expect them to be failing, okay? So here, what we would expect is our beta coefficient would be smaller than one. And then in this scenario, basically, schools are freaked out by the accountability stringency, so they are actually failing at higher rates than what you would expect. Here's two examples from two states where we plotted basically actual failure rates. That's the dotted blue line with uh, simulated failure rates here. Basically, in Michigan, right, schools are, failure rates are sort of st staying, keeping up with uh, simulated uh, failure rates. And then at the end, Michigan really ratchets up its accountability stringency, but the actual failure rates don't increase, right? Whereas in Washington State, Basically, every time you see, or well, especially towards the latter period, when you see an increase in accountability stringency, failure rates go up too. So the way that we're gonna test this empirically is we'll basically run a model where we look at the natural log, right, of actual school failure rates within each state in each year, regress that against a natural log of our simulated failure rates so that basically we're looking at that beta coefficient uh, there to see if how, uh, whether that beta coefficient is different from one or not, okay? And we'll include state time fixed effects and covariates. Go ahead. Okay. Yes, we've lagged it. Yes. Yes, that's right. That's right. Go ahead. Use of trade dissimulation. Is that a fixed bucket of cost time? Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically here are our results. These basically are results for four different models where we've included state fixed effects, year fixed effects, covariates, okay? And then we also allow for state and year fixed effect, or state and year to interact with each other. And basically what you see are pretty consistent coefficients there that are all much smaller than one. They're all statistically smaller, uh, different from one, okay? And what that basically suggests, right, is that as uh, the percentage of simulated failure rates are increasing by one, right, we don't see a corresponding same percentage of schools that are also failing by 1% too. So what this suggests is that schools are actually sort of meeting sort of um, um, the ratcheting up of, of state accountability standards, okay? We also looked at this by uh, states with pre-NCLB accountability and without, okay? And uh, these results are not statistically different from each other, but we do see some evidence here that s s schools and states without pre-NCLB accountability are failing at s slightly higher rates, but also statistically different from one, too, okay? So those results suggest something promising, right? That schools are sort of aligning their resources together, or at least they're doing something in order to meet these new accountability requirements. Now the main question is whether these efforts are now translating over to student responses, okay? And, um, and basically to examine sort of student, how students, uh, student responses to sort of the increasing uh, accountability stringency, what we did is 
Now, instead of looking at basically school failure rates, we looked at basically student achievement performance as measured by the NAEP, okay? And the key thing here is that the NAEP is just basically this test that's national, this test that's administered to sort of nationally represented populations across all states uh, every two years or so, right? And states aren't held accountable, right, to based on sort of the performance on the NAEP. So what, what's nice about the NAEP is that it gives us this measure that should reflect actual student learning or student achievement, right, as opposed to how well they're able to align themselves to meet accountability standards here. So here, basically, uh, our identification strategy here is, again, to use our simulated uh, stringency score as well as state year fixed effects and covariates. Go ahead. This is the last chunk on analysis. Yep. Is the way you created your stringency, so I'm wondering if it is the case that fine, yes, the stringency, uh, the state increased their stringency, but it still wasn't binding on many schools, like many schools were still so overperforming relative to the old stringency that this increase didn't threaten many. But, but is the way you created your stringency measure, um, is it designed to, not, to avoid that? So, yeah, so, so basically this is a measure of the policy themselves, yeah. not in terms of like how many of these schools, right, like would have been held accountable to well, that policy or under threat for that policy. And you had that three line graph of initially, mm -hmm. uh, the, essentially the 45 degree yep. versus, uh, so my concern, or my thought is if, and that, that suggests yep. that it's binding. You increase stringency, yep. but that, that pulls some, that pulls one percent more schools mm -hmm. down below uh, BYP. Right. Um, but so my concern yep. is, did you see, perhaps the performance of the schools were already so high relative to the old uh, stringency initially, mm -hmm. they increased it by one point, but just that, that doesn't have any effect on schools above. Mm -hmm. So it's not that the schools are positive reacting. It's like, okay, well, great, so you set a higher bar, and it's still below me, I don't care. And so my, that, that's my concern, and I'm wondering if something about the yeah. mechanisms of your, your stimulated efficiency avoids that from being one potential interpretation of it, less than one coefficient in the model. Yeah. Um. I need to think about that, right? So basically the idea here is if all of the schools are really high performing schools, right, they're already, there's already a ceiling effect here, right? Then maybe this, this might not, that coefficient would not, you know, would not, the null there would not be one, right? Or the schools are not doing well. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point, let me think about that, yeah. Uh, okay, so, so let me just quickly now present the sort of the results for uh, uh, achievement, right, for um, using our stringency measure here, okay? And basically these are the, uh, these are basically the coefficients, right, for um, our s simulated stringency variable that's been lagged by one year and we've taken the natural log of it, okay? So what I've already done here is that because this is a level log model, I, you have to multiply the coefficients by uh, 0.01, so I've already done that. So now these coefficients are basically NAEP scale scores, okay? And I've sort of summarized the outcomes here for grade four math, grade eight math, grade four reading, grade eight reading here, okay? And the three different models here include basically state and year fixed effects, with covariates and um, um, sort of allowing for the interaction term between state and year. Go ahead. Can you tell me a little bit more about how like, the difference between the stringency measure and the NAEP measure? Because that's the way that students are affected schools are shown, or are there other things that the schools are affected? Like, is there other ways other than the frequency? Well, so schools, so that's, that's, the, that's the main sort of question, right, about NCLB, right, is that there are a number of things that schools could do in order 
to be able to meet their AYP requirements, right? One of the things that they could do is they could improve instruction, okay? That would be ideal. If that occurred, then you would expect to see positive effects, basically, in students' achievement, right? However, schools could do other things, too, right? Like, they have um, their, you know, other research that I've done has sort of suggested that schools manipulate, basically, their subgroup sizes in order to be able to de uh, increase their confidence intervals to, to change their sort of proficiency levels. They could sort of reorganize, basically, their sub subgroups if they wanted to. Um, so there are ways, basically, that schools could sort of meet accountability requirements, but not necessarily be sort of, uh, be sort of focused on instruction, right? Um, the other thing that they could do is they could teach to the test, right? They could, you know, highly align their instruction with exactly what's covered on the accountability, on the assessment test, but that information doesn't translate over to a broader standardized measure. Um, we could do that. I, we haven't done that yet, but yeah. So let me just talk about these results, okay? So um, for the most part, what we see in terms of broad trends, and this is going to hold for sort of many of the subgroup analyses that we did, we don't see much treatment effect at all for grade four, grade four outcomes for either math or for reading, okay? In the impacts that we do see, for grade eight in math and for reading are small, okay? Let me help you sort of interpret what, what these coefficients actually mean here because that they're in such a small scale, right? So what, how you should interpret those coefficients is that a 1% increase in stringency score is related to a 0.13 increase in eighth grade math and a 0.009 increase in eighth grade reading score on the NAEP, okay? So one way that we could sort of contextualize that result is that the average increase in stringency for states was about 33 percent between 2003 and 2011. So a 33 percent increase in state accountability stringency, the average change in stringency from 2003 to 2011, resulted in a 0.36 to 0.46 point gain on the state average scale for uh, eighth grade math that's about a 0.04 to 0.05 standard deviation in effect size units, okay? And to give you a relative comparison, on the NAEP, the average increase in NAEP math, scale, or math scores across states was about seven points, or a 0.8 standard deviation. And a 33% increase in stringency resulted in a 0.28 to 0.52 point gain in state average scale scores for eighth grade reading, okay? That translates into about a 0.04 to 0.08 standard deviation, okay? And just for comparison, the average increase in NAEP reading scores across states was about 2.28 points or about 0.34 standard deviations. So even though we do find significant effects for eighth grade math um, and not consistently uh, significant effects for eighth grade reading, the, the, the magnitude of these effects are really small, okay? We do a number of sensitivity tests. I don't have time exactly to get into the sensitivity tests, um, but basically we do all the typical things in terms of looking at balance and covariates and also looking at sort of lags and leads. What this result suggests is that this is basically a plot of any possible anticipatory effects, right? And this is... Um, sort of affects one year after, basically, uh, the, it was introduced. And what the results at least suggest in eighth grade was that uh, we don't have any anticipatory effects, but that the effect after one year sort of faded out. So maybe much of the uh, uh, treatment occurred in the earlier part of NCLB. Okay. And then basically what we did was we also looked at whether there was treatment effect heterogeneity um, across sort of different groups, right? So one idea, one question might be is that, well, even though the effects were small or there were no effects, uh, perhaps NCLB affected different, uh, different subgroups uh, really differently, okay? And so the question then is, uh, did, did NCLB affect all of these groups um, in the same way? Here what I've done is I've basically plotted the confidence intervals of the impacts for the average effect, 
okay? That's highlighted in blue here, and then for each of the different subgroups, okay? And um, this is basically by subgroups for English language learners, free reduced price lunch, students with disabilities, okay? Again, um, and then this is for fourth grade, and then for eighth grade, and for math, and for reading. We have a lot of plots here, we don't have to go through them all. But the main thing here is that it's pretty consistent that there are no effects for fourth grade, and this is consistent for all of the subgroups, okay? We do see evidence of effects uh, for ELL, free reduced price lunch, and uh, students with disabilities in terms of it being reliable for free reduced price lunch and students with disabilities. Uh, we don't have enough precision to say much about ELL, but it's trending in the positive direction here. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned earlier at the beginning that you weren't able to capture alternative tests. And I know, mm -hmm. uh, with this group, I know in New York City, yeah. and, and seven or mm -hmm. so, they were told you're not testing the right number of kids. Mm -hmm. They were pulling these kids out of. So if that, if mm -hmm. inclusion policies on some of these sub subgroups are changing over this time, that yeah. could be contributing to some of these results? Yes, yeah, so we do control for inclusion, well, we control at least for the inclusion of, uh, in, the, in the NAEP at least, whether different groups, like the percentage of people who are excluded on the NAEP. Um, okay, but, I'm sorry, is that what I'm hearing? NAEP scores or state scores converted to the NAEP? So these are actual NAEP scores. So these are the NAEP scores. And you're right that different sort of cohorts of NAEP have different exclusion rates for like yeah. students with disabilities, yeah, I right? I was actually thinking with respect to inclusion in state level tests, not here in the subject. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, we also looked at sort of differences in treatment effects by different um, race ethnicity groups here, right? So um, again, no effects for fourth grade. For eighth grade here, um, at least for math, right, um, we see effects that are po trending in the positive direction for all three groups here, okay? Um, so um, not statistically significant for black and Hispanic groups, but those confidence intervals are much larger, okay? And we also sort of looked at the effects based on different subscales within math, right? Um, again, pretty consistent effects with the exception of geometry here in, in, uh, in uh, eighth grade. And then also for literacy here too. And then finally, um, one of the things that we looked at was we looked at effects basically by percentile performance, right? From 10th, the 25th, the 50th, 70th, and 90th percentile performance, okay? And what we see here is evidence that there are sort of small um, impacts on, um, or at least slightly larger effects for those who are sort of performing at the bottom of the distribution uh, than um, there are for uh, students who are performing at the, the higher ends of the distribution here, okay? Um, and then, again, we see the same pattern of results for reading, uh, but not statistically significant here. And then finally, we looked at the differences in effects for states that had pre-NCLB accountability policies versus states that did not have pre-NCLB accountability policies, okay? And overall, basically, uh, so sort of the coefficients that are on that top row there basically are coefficients for the relationship for stringency for states uh, without pre-NCLB accountability policies. And then the co these coefficients are basically the coefficient for the interaction effect. So what this suggests is that um, um, that states uh, with pre-NCLB accountability policies have smaller impacts, right? But not statistically different here. Okay, so what do we make of these results? Uh, looking forward to hearing your feedback here. But generally we find consistent but very small uh, math, eighth grade math effects across all subgroups and subscales. It appears that at least from our, uh, our lag event history analysis that gains occurred in the early period of NCLB and the effects were slightly larger for the lower performing groups um, and at risk students. 
Um, some evidence that there was small but positive effects for students with disabilities, Hispanic uh, English language learners, and lower performing students in reading, but these effects were not reliable. We don't have any evidence of, of effects for fourth grade reading and math. Um, and in some, fact, some cases they trended in the negative direction, okay? And treatment effects were not statistically different for states with and without pre-NCLB accountability plans, okay? So this part is purely preliminary, okay? So what we also wanted to do is we wanted to get a sense, well, could we get a handle on some mechanisms for how this might, uh, how these effects might or may be coming out? Right, so what we also did was we looked at basically how much uh, uh, basically relationship between accountability stringency and expenditures for different types of school expenditures, right? So um, we looked at student support services, expenditures for student support services, instruction, general administration, school administration, operations, and other types of student support, okay? Again, not much is happening here, okay? We see small, or we see some evidence that uh, stringency is related to more spending in student support services, okay? But again, let me give you a sense that the magnitude of this effect is pretty small. So a 33% increase in accountability stringency resulted in an increase in per pupil spending of about $10.89 on student ser services, okay? The average over this time period was about $443, okay? Small increases in administrative services and operations, but not really reliable, the .05 level. Not much evidence that increased stringency was related to increased spending on instructional services, okay? preliminary results here. So in terms of thinking about policy conclusions, right, um, one of the first things that occurred to us when we started this project was that it was surprising to us that these AYP rules were just, or state's accountability rules were not available in any centralized place at all. Um, and at a very basic descriptive level, um, it seems like a problem for the legislation that given the huge investments that states have to make, that it is so, that it's difficult uh, to be able to, uh, to sort of understand exactly what states did in implementing their accountability policies. So, you know, one point here to think about is more policy transparency is probably needed if we're going to ask states to undertake these enormous investments. Um, and overall, uh, we think that schools did succeed in responding to increased accountability pressures under NCLB, okay? But for now, at least, our sc these school efforts did not appear to translate into substantial improvements in student learning. The uh, accountability policies might have had small but positive effects on students in eighth grade math, about effect sizes of between 0.04 and 0.05 standard deviations, okay? And we have some evidence that the largest effects were for students who were lower performing students, okay? Um, we see some evidence that the more stringent accountability policies resulted in small increases in per pupil spending on student services. And what is included in the student services buckets includes spending on guidance, health services, speech therapy, okay? And that, you know, now we're sort of, I'm kind of speculating here, right? That it is possible that maybe NCLB provided schools with increased money to provide supports for students who are most at risk, okay? And maybe these results sort of help translate into slightly improved benefits on math for, for older students, okay? It's interesting that eighth grade students may have benefited more because they had more exposure to school services and they were also sort of present in the system when NCLB was first introduced. Um, but that these benefits did not seem to continue as much under uh, accountability reform. Our main thought sort of at, you know, in sort of thinking about this was that as we sort of move into this next phase of uh, accountability policies under the Every Student Succeeds Act is that we think probably experimentation across states is a good idea, okay? But that some way for us to be able to understand what states are doing in terms of policy transparency and some way to be able to evaluate this is probably also needed in some kind of systematic way. 
And the main issue right now with ESA is that it doesn't really have provisions to encourage this kind of policy transparency that would allow us to be able to learn from these experiments. So let me go ahead and stop here and ask if there are any additional questions or thoughts. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let me. I made a slide actually of this, right? Um, so I created a slide, sort of thinking about looking at our results versus the D and Jacob results. So these are basically our results, where I've sort of scaled the the NAEP results by their, you know the in average increase in stringency scores. Okay, and. Um, so, you know, our results basically suggest, you know, uh, we don't see the effects in math that they have, right? Um, and um, they didn't have, uh, find effects for eighth grade math, but we did, right? Um, and um, they've also found effects for fourth grade reading, which we did not here. And in general, the magnitude of our effects are much smaller than D and Jacob. So, and here, this is where I'm also looking for some feedback too, right? So in terms of thinking about sort of the differences in the research designs, right? The first one is that our comparisons are pretty different here, right? Theirs is pre-NCLB accountability policies, ours is not. Uh, or sorry, theirs is pre-NCLB accountability policies, ours is not. Ours is about sort of state implementation stringency. Our outcome years are slightly different and our, um, the states that are included in our sample are different. Now, I think the thing that sort of the crux of their evaluation, I, I guess, rests on this idea that there was no change, basically, in stringency scores pre-NCLB and post-NCLB, right? That's, that's sort of the main identifying assumption, isn't it? Like, that's, that's what sort of identifies their comparison, and we can't test that. We don't have stringency scores, so at least in that realm, I, we can't say anything about sort of the identification of their strategy. This, but this sort of gets back to the question I asked earlier about what the treatment is. I don't think their treatment is stringency. Their treatment is basically, right, like it's NCLB, right, uh, and their comparison, the counterfactual, is the fact that, that their accountability plans didn't change pre-NCLB and post-NCLB, right? Um, and so their treatment is basically the adoption or the introduction of a new NCLB accountability policy, right? So in that way, yes, we are sort of, we're defining treatments as being different here and that we're looking at sort of gradation of intensity of accountability stringency across the different states. So that, that might be part of the reason, right, why our effects are different, right? Like. Uh, probably is a main reason why. Um, yeah, I, again, yeah. I don't know whether, and as a follow-up to that, but I had one yeah. other question. So I, I think the point you make about you not having pre, I mean, you see, you see movement afterwards. Yeah. You know that that was moving from where they were before. Um, right, right. Uh, so, so that we can't sort of fully evaluate, right? But it does seem like if you look at some of the, I don't think I have, uh, maybe, sorry, I don't mean to make everybody vomit. <laughs> um, but like one of this plot here, you know, I spent a lot of time looking at this plot with basically accountability stringency for states with pre-NCLB and without pre-NCLB uh, accountability policy. And um, so it does seem that, you know, states without pre-NCLB accountability policies did adopt sort of these more stringent kind of rules. That's one thing that this plot shows. The other thing that this shows is that there is this dip, basically, in accountability stringency, you know, uh, after 2003. And what that kind of suggests to me is that these, even states that had pre-NCLB accountability policies were adopting rules that basically watered down what their original rules were, right? So, or what their rules were in 2003. So that suggests that they are, that, um, that, basically that these states treatment or their accountability stringency is changing even in these states that are being defined as the comparisons. Go ahead, Jim. So the other question I had was, um, 
I didn't understand when you were. So I would not say in, um, in general that in K-12 interventions that 0.05 standard deviations is a very small effect. Okay. And, yeah. and so what I didn't understand, you, you made a comparison to something that was the average NAEP change across states or something. Yeah. I didn't know, I wasn't really sure what that was because it makes it seem like it's very small, but I wasn't sure what that was. But if you make that comparison to lots of other interventions that occur, point of, I'm not saying it's large, but I would yeah. not say that it's trivial and we shouldn't think about it as a meaningful effect. Yeah, so actually this is helpful for getting feedback because I am also not sure, right? So on the one thing to remember here is that these are effect sizes that are at the state level too, right? And normally we are also used to interpreting effect sizes at the student level. So sort of moving, like so, it is possible, like I did think about it, it is possible that a 0.05 effect size at the state level, that could be much bigger than you would expect, right? Uh, so I am certainly open <laughs> for feedback on that. Um, and I guess I just wasn't quite sure like how to think about sort of this 0.05 in terms of uh, effect size. Like the only, so just as a placeholder, this wasn't exactly the right comparison, but you know, what I was sort of thinking about was, well, what's the average quote unquote growth rates of states, you know, across time? And how does this impact sort of compare to the average sort of growth rates in terms of state performance over time? Uh, so that was sort of one thought that I had in terms of thinking about sort of the relative magnitude of this, but I am certainly definitely, like I, like I, I, I'm definitely open for feedback on how to think about if that effect size is big or if that's small. Go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so this is sort of the central question or tension in the accountability literature, right? There's there's a lot of sort of questions, there's a number of sort of different papers uh, or of people being worried about um, that schools might be engaging in other practices to sort of meet accountability requirements that isn't about improving instruction, right? So this includes things like teaching to the test, right? Uh, this, you know, there's a paper by David Figlio that about sort of increasing sort of sugar and caloric intake on, on test taking days, right? Um, our own sort of work on this is about sort of different categorizations in terms of subgroup sizes and pe putting people, students into different subgroups. Um, so these are all sort of, uh, the part of the reason why I also went into wanting to look at sort of school expenditures too was, uh, I was interested in sort of seeing whether basically uh, schools were hiring a lot more sort of administrators to help schools basically whose job or function was to sort of comply with these rules, right? To, right. Um, and so I think that schools can sort of engage in both sort of legal and sort of less legal ways that are technically legal but may not necessarily li live up to the spirit of the law in order to be able to um, sort of meet these requirements. But this does seem to be sort of the central tension of accountability, right? Whether this is actually reflecting improved performance. Um, I don't know who was first, Luke or Dan, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, I, I, I <laughs> uh, so is your method, I, and I just lost track, is your yeah. method rule out the possibility that states are just making the test easier as they're making the school easier? It does in that if it gets reflected basically in the NAEP equivalent cutoff scores, right, then it would get, they would have lower stringency scores. Okay. Right. So yeah. it's not the case that, that uh, taking it back from off of uh, Walter's comment, it's not the case that the reason why they are uh, reacting, schools are reacting and meeting AYP goals because that's based on the state test and then your effect on achievement is actually based on the NAEP test, which is not factored in the stringency. That isn't a source of explanation between why. So you. Oh, yeah, I had the exact same question. So okay. could, could it just be that they are? Cr 
Yes. Right. That that's the that's the that's the main right. Like that is the main sort of point here. Right. Is that people are worried that maybe there might be sort of this teaching to the test. So they're improving on their state assessments. Right. Right. So we can sort of have that, I guess, that, d that debate, right? What I'm sort of suggesting or arguing here is that maybe NAEP is this measure of sort of achievement that is a more broad-based or measure of sort of learning or and student achievement. Um, and, um, and, um, and, you know, that that does not seem to be at least translating over to the, the NAEP measure. Well, can you look at the, the NAEP scores differently between the states where, because isn't there always an opposite that, that, that connects the state test to the NAEP test? I think yeah. you, you can. Yes. Is, is that yeah. kind of interesting? I mean, could you say, okay, well, in this, uh, do I see the differential effects of state stringency on NAEP scores in the states where the local tests? Oh, so like, yeah, are really different from, or you, they could be a joke, or they could be really different. Correct. Yeah. Is there a significant gap in the BAYP score because you've looked at how similar they are to me? What we look at is basically how, um, like, how, not how similar, but like, um, what the what the equivalent sort of proficient, what the scale score would be on what would be considered proficient on, on the. Standards, the standards that may Yeah, yeah, that would be, that could be something that we could look into. That's, that's helpful. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've been think now I'm totally sort of extrapolating, right? But I, you know, I've been thinking a little bit about sort of this role of regulation in school improvement, right? Um, I recently read a paper that was about sort of mandating higher sort of course, uh, more uh, course requirements, basically, uh, in Michigan, right? Uh, where, you know, basically the mandate was that students had to take uh, sort of higher level courses, especially in math and science. And they looked at basically achievement outcomes as a result of students. Like, so students did take more higher level math and science courses, right? And that was especially true among sort of lower performing and low SES students. But that those results didn't necessarily translate over into ACT achievement scores, right? Um, and so I, you know, I was reading that paper also thinking about my paper thinking that that, you know, as a policy perspective, as a policy approach, um, you know, should we be concerned sort of about, like, this idea of using sort of these standards as levers to sort of produce um, achievement and that um, it may be effective in getting sort of institutions to be able to comply, but it's much more questionable whether that actually translates into the thing that we're actually interested in, you know. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your feedback. Okay, I don't know how to do this.